I do is I say, you know, take the credit, the burden of credibility off your shoulders and put it onto the shoulders of people who actually have the credibility. So you heard me say, I've been working with a lot of dentists and what they tell me is that. So now I'm not talking, here's the, here's not like what I believe. It's like, I work with lots of dentists who are exactly like you and here's what they tell me. And I can use that. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson. And we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got David Premer with us, and we're going to cover objection handling and insights from pandemic selling. So, David, welcome to the show. Great to be with you here, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, I guess by way of introduction, David... uh, He had a career as a research scientist, and after that, he found himself in the sales world, and he's now the founder and chief sales scientist at Cerebral Selling, and he's passionate about teaching the science of modern selling. He's also the author of the bestseller, Sell the Way You Buy, a modern approach to sales that actually works, which is something we all need. So, So, David, I'll jump into it here. First question how does your background in science inform the way that you develop sales tactics? Yeah, well, you know, everyone has their own origin story about how they got into sales. And, and there's actually quite a lot of people who get into sales from the sciences and engineering. But for me, like, I'm one of these people who got into sales by accident and realized very quickly that, like, I love to sell. I love the passion, the conviction, all the kind of great things that come with selling. But I don't like talking to salespeople, right? Just like everyone else. And so, what I realized is that there's a there's kind of like a method. There's a, a, a you know princi- scientific principles around per- kind of persuasion and conviction and emotions and all these things that kind of you know get shoved into a blender that produce a certain outcome when a salesperson is talking to a customer. And I started picking apart the world of sales almost like a bit of an engineering problem. And I realized that like if you can understand the pathways and mechanisms by which human beings make purchasing decisions. Well, then you can sell in an authentic, human, high conviction way that doesn't make you feel gross. And so that's kind of how I I took my science engineering background and applied it to sales. Fantastic. And uh, what exactly about uh, the pandemic gave you these insights that you're going to share about objection handling? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of things have changed. It's funny, one of the problems that exists in the world of selling is that for so many people, the sales motion that they execute is the same one that, you know, they learned 5, 10, 20 years ago, however long it was. And the world of buying has changed so much over that time. And certainly, the world of buying has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. And so it's interesting when you see things like I, I'm a big fan of sales is life. I learned so much from sales about, you know, like watching my kids negotiate with me and those kinds of things. But when you think about what's happened in the pandemic, there's been all types of objections, more specifically thrown at people like politicians, you know, medical professionals, like look at, you know, Anthony Fauci, you know, kind of on on all of these news shows and people are bombarding him with questions. Why are you imposing these restrictions? Why do we have to wear masks again? You know, here in Ontario where I am, you know, the government was criticized for when the lockdowns were happening. Why are you shutting down these mom and pop operations, but you're letting these like big box stores, Walmart and Costco stay open. So you see all of these kind of very emotionally charged objections being thrown at politicians in the kind of the public sphere. And if you kind of step step back and take a look at how they address those objections, and I think, you know, especially nowadays, they're kind of more highly trained in how to deal with the public. uh, It's really interesting. So, So there's definitely been a lot of examples of that, but certainly we can kind of get into this a little bit is that the things that people value changed in the last couple of years. And so kind of the the root cause of these objections and where they're coming from is a lot different than they were a couple of years ago. And and and, and so uh, I, I guess, how, how would you suggest a salesperson adapt their objection handling strategies for uh, for hard times or specifically these times? Yeah, well, like the first thing is, you know, and you look at examples of, how these politicians and medical practitioners have handled objections, a lot of them do a really good job of um, doing what I call acknowledging and empathizing. So this idea that when someone launches an objection at you, everything from like, it's too expensive, or it'll never work here, or kind of call me back in six months, it's coming from a place of emotion. And when they launch that objection, they're expecting some kind of 
you know, uh, antagonistic response. Oh no, it's not too expensive. Oh no, here's the value. Oh, here's why we're putting the mask mandates back in. And what actually happens in your brain is that the part of the brain that's associated with kind of like that antagonism and aggression is the part that lights up when that objection, when we surface those objections. So as we try to handle those objections, it's really important to try to remember that we need to move that dialogue before we even handle it from the part of the brain associated with that kind of like that, that antagonistic and very high emotion into the more reasonable logical part. To give you an example, let's say my daughter comes to me in the middle of the night and she says, you know, mommy, daddy, uh, there's a monster in my closet. It's going to come out and eat me in the middle of the night. I'm scared, right? Coming back to my daughter and saying, you're being stupid. There's no monster in the closet. Go back to bed. You know, <laughs> That's not a good objection handling response. I mean, as correct as that might be, that's not going to, you know, de-escalate the situation. And, not, you know, you laugh and, you know, but the reality is when our customers give us objections, it's coming from a oftentimes a very similar place. Right, right. So. So what would you suggest instead? Uh, and, and let's use let's use a really let, why don't we why don't we game plan the, do kind of role play this and you know for something real like uh, so I, it, let's just say you're trying to sell me I don't know uh, a new laser for my dental practice right mm -hmm. uh, how and I say hey you know I just I, I can't look at anything like this right now because and you're we're in the we're in, you you stop by and you're in the in our in our front lobby and you've got, caught my attention and you tell me the basics of what you do and I say hey I, I just I can't look at anything like this right this year because, you know, I, I'm just trying to get the practice going again right now. You know, so many people didn't come and go to the dentist during the pandemic. And I'm just trying to get things back, back rolling again right now. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, Steve, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. You know what? I speak to dentists every day and they, they say the exact same thing. It's been quite a topsy-turvy world over the last couple of years. And I, I don't doubt that you have a lot of patients that are kind of experiencing that you know, so step one, like the acknowledge and empathize, right? Mm -hmm. Step two, now again, I don't know a lot about dental lasers, so I'm gonna riff on this with you. Sure, sure, I mean, but, but I'm they're, like, say, they're like every other laser. They just shoot yeah. stuff at stuff. <laughs> so I might say, you know, something like, well, you know, it's interesting, I, I totally get where you're coming from, and I definitely don't wanna bother you if this is not of interest, but it's actually interesting because of all of these backlogs of patients, the dentists I'm talking to are completely inundated and their front desk staff are going nuts. And they're trying to find opportunities to introduce more efficient tools and technology into their business to kind of deal with the backlog. And what's interesting about our lasers, that actually helps with that. A lot of dentists, and I, I think I've seen in your operatory, are coming from, you know, the old model, you know, 1000 laser, but our model 3000 laser actually allows you to see more patients in less time. And there's actually, you know, lower operating costs than what you're, you know, what you're probably used to now. And again, I don't know if this is, you know, uh, of 100% interest to you, but I do know I've been working with a lot of dentists lately who've mentioned the same. Is it worth, you know, just even exploring just to see if it makes sense to continue the conversation? Yeah, actually, I, I, uh, I'm so booked right now, but if it was faster, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Let's set it up with my secretary. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, like, <laughs> the other, right. it's like a, yeah, it's more efficient. It's more of this, but you see also, the call to action at the end is also very important. Now we didn't get into this, you know, all of the science of this, but um, there's a lot of data that points to the call to action. So whenever I like to say, I, I have the objection, I reframe it, and then I'm going to ask you to do something. And maybe the, it's a follow on question. Like, do, have, have you noticed that, you know, maybe your laser now is like working really slow or like, how long does it take you to process a patient now? Like I could go into that kind of level of dialogue. But let's say, for example, I wanted to go in for like the call to action, say like, hey, how about we have a conversation and see if we do this? There's kind of two different kinds of calls to action. There's what what I might refer to as the interest based call to action. Like, hey, Steve, are you interested in in even just exploring this? Like, I'm not asking for like a, you're signing on the dotted line. Like, are you interested? And then there's the more specific call to action, which is like, hey, Steve, how about this? Why don't we schedule some time next Tuesday? I'm available between like nine and noon. And I'm happy to give you like a one hour complete deep dive demonstration and overview of how this could help your business. How does that sound? One is very interest based. One is very specific. And what the data shows, I love, there's some data from a software company called Gong who does all these kind of conversational analytics. And what they found kind of, and this is more for cold outreach, they analyzed 300,000 cold outreaches and they judge success as booking a meeting within 10 days. And they found that the interest-based calls to action actually produced twice the conversion rate 
as the specific ones. So it's kind of like, imagine you and I met and I wanted to ask you out on a date. Okay, like we just met. We met at, at Jane's party. So I said, you know, oh, hey, Steve, you know, we met the other night at Jane's party. Um, you know, how about, you know, we, we catch like a Leafs game next Saturday night, maybe go out for a beer afterwards. And, you know, maybe like we could take a drive up north on Sunday. How does that, like, now I'm getting like really specific and you're thinking, this is really weird and oddly specific. But if I said, hey, Steve, like, would you be interested in doing something sometime? That's a much lower barrier thing for you to say yes to. So anyways, as a total aside, when, when the outreach is cold and you're worried about coming on too strong with the customer, going with those interest-based calls to action, get them to take a little step and just say, yeah, I'm interested, and then take it from there. Okay, well, that, that's, that's fantastic advice. Um, the, the, first, the first thing there I noticed was, was the, uh, we, we've all heard so much about empathy as a, as, as a concept and uh, putting yourself in the shoes of the buyer and kind of understanding them. Um, how, what are some strategy, strategies you use for that to really kind of disarm them right off the bat and, and empathize with them, put yourself in their shoes um, in, in you know, this, tar- this hard time or any hard time? For sure. Well, you know, the easiest tactic I covered, this is tactic number one in my book, which I did not invent. Uh, I invented the book, but I did not invent this tactic, by the way. And, and a lot of people use it. Oftentimes people refer to it as like the feel felt found. And, and I like feel felt found, which is basically saying, if, in case you're not familiar, because some people aren't, is you respond to the objection by using the words feel felt found in three consecutive sentences. So Steve, totally understand how you feel. I work with lots of cl- customers who felt exactly the same way you did. What they found was the, this new laser actually allowed them to be more efficient in their practice. And then I follow up with a question. So I like the feel felt found because it kind of puts your mind in that zone. But what's interesting, and you know, I kind of do this a little bit instinctively now, but I want to spell it out, is that one of the biggest challenges is uh, when it comes to selling and especially objection handling is credibility. Now, I, or some, maybe some of the folks that are listening to this are brand new sellers. Maybe you're new into the sales game, or maybe you are new to your company, okay? Now, imagine you are trying to sell that dental laser, and I'm going toe-to-toe with a dentist, okay? I've never been a dentist. I don't know what dentists do every day, uh, but I, you know, I'm in sales, and I'm here to kind of sell you this laser. And so the dentist could be thinking in their head, who the hell is this guy? And what are they going to teach me about lasers? You know, like, I'm the dentist. I've been doing this for years. And so what I do is I say, you know, Take the credit, the burden of credibility off your shoulders and put it onto the shoulders of people who actually have the credibility. So you heard me say, I've been working with a lot of dentists and what they tell me is that. So now I'm not talking, here's the, here's not like what I believe. It's like, I work with lots of dentists who are exactly like you and here's what they tell me. And I can use that, what I refer to as we phrasing versus I phrasing, like I feel, I felt, I found. It's like, we phrasing, like what we found in our company. Here's what, you know, we found in the industry. Here's what customers like you have found. I'm not, I'm not putting any burden of credibility onto me. So that's a really important distinction. And of course, if you are experienced and been working for your company for a long time, more power to you. But if you're new or you're young, you don't have that credibility, always try to kind of fall back and put that burden of credibility on the we versus the I. That's fantastic advice. Um, and how do you think, uh, customers and prospects behaviors have changed, uh, throughout these difficult times? Um, I guess have, have any of these things you're talking about, have, has there been a shift in the last few years? I, I like that I say hard economic times. We're kind of going from the pandemic problems to now we have a recession problem. It's like a new problem. It's like we, we've moved so seamlessly from one problem to the oh, next, yeah. but <laughs> But um, how would you, how would you, have you seen a, a fundamental shift in behavior or, or would you say that these things would have been this, would these answers have been the same five years ago? Well, I wouldn't say it's a much, as much about behavior. I mean, there is an element of behavior, meaning like we're more distracted, we're, you know, we're focused elsewhere. People were at home, people were isolating. People needed to kind of, you know, respond and turn on a dime at a moment's notice when their family members were sick. So there are some behavioral changes, but I'd say the biggest thing has to do with values. And, you know, what I kind of talk about is like value and return on investment are two completely different principles that salespeople confuse all the time. Return on investment is like a financial calculation of an expected rate of return. Value 
is a discretionary feeling. So for example, let's say I'm selling that laser to the dentist and I say, well, you know, if you, you know, you use this, uh, this laser, it's going to make you more efficient. It's going to save you time. Sure. You're outlaying the cash to buy it now, but over the course of the next few years, it's going to pay for itself. I, I deliver that message. The only thing that matters in that entire delivery is whether or not you believe that what I said is going to happen is going to happen, right? If you're like, well, I don't really do that many laser, you know, treatments now, or like, you know, I think it's actually, you know, probably the payback's not going to be that aggressive, or I have a lot of elderly patients who don't want to use a laser. I'm mean, again, I'm just making this up. I don't know. Sure, sure. But, you know, you're trying to decide whether or not you buy into what I'm saying. And that buy-in is a subjective, it's subjective feeling. It's a feelings of value. Like you, you spend your hard earned money. And if you're listening to this, you spend your hard earned money on things that you value that another person would look at and say, that's ridiculous. So back to the pandemic, what's changed, the things that people value have changed. So that dentist may not a year ago have cared too much about the efficiency of their practice and being able to put through this massive backlog of patients. Hospitals, when they were buying personal protective equipment three years ago, price was the most important thing. Quality, hey look, quality had to be good enough and delivery timeline, like it needs to get here whenever. Now all of a sudden we're in the middle of the pandemic and there's no PPE to be found or toilet paper for that matter. It's like, how much is that PPE worth now? It doesn't matter how much it costs. It just needs to be top quality and be here yesterday. So I say that the things that people value in their business and the pandemic have changed. And if you're still going out with the same value proposition, like for example, I'll give you another quick example. So I'm in the sales training business. Okay. So I train sales teams generally at, at high growth B2B technology companies. And you'd think that when they bring me in to train their sales teams, what they're looking for is they're looking for some kind of conversion in some funnel metric, right? It's like, okay, well, we, you know, our close rate was this before now it's, you know, is X now it's Y. And so now there's more revenue coming into the business, but some people invest in sales training because their teams have been at home for the last two years. They've had little investment, little engagement, and the companies want to do something for their teams by investing in sales training and show them that we're going to, that we're doing this, right? That wasn't a thing two years ago. I mean, engagement was certainly, but you know, the fact that people are, are isolated at home and, and not getting training was not a thing two years ago. Now it is. And, the, and don't kid yourself, people buy training because of that just as much as they do for other reasons. So this idea of the things that your customers value, the subjective feelings that they're buying when they buy you change over time and they've certainly changed in the last couple of years. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that's industry by industry and really it's, uh, it's worth everyone sitting down and noodling on how has my buyer changed? How, how has this affected my buyer and, and specifically their industry and, and try to get inside their head a little bit? 100%. So I, I've heard you say that not all objections are meant to be overcome. Um, what do you mean by that? And how do we choose which ones we should overcome and, and where, where should we not try to overcome the objection? Yeah, well, this is where it takes a little bit of investigation work, because like, think about it. If I were to ask you, should we sell to everyone who's willing to give us money for our product or service? Like there's people out there that are willing to pay you for your product or service that I'm willing to bet are not a good fit, right? And so taking bad money is not a good thing. There's also people who, you know, will give all sorts of objections as to why they can't buy your service, but they won't tell you what the real reason is. For example, let's say I ask you out on a date, Steve, and you don't want to go with me, okay? But, you know, we just met, you don't want to hurt my feelings. What do you say? So I say, hey, Steve, let's go out Saturday night. What do you say? I say, oh, I'm super busy right oh, now. Oh, you're I... busy. Oh, yeah. that's... That's too bad. Hey, look, I get it. I know I'm springing this on you at the last minute. Um, what about what about next Saturday? Are you free next Saturday, Steve? Uh, my hair needs to be um, washed. Yeah. Actually. Oh my gosh. You, you know, don't talk. I hair care is super important. I totally get that. So you see what I'm doing here? <laughs> it's like I asked you on a date. You didn't want to tell me. Oh, I don't want to go with you. So instead, you said, "Oh, I'm busy." So what do I do? I come back with another objection handle. Okay, like. Steve, why don't you, this is a tactic I call turning the future into the past, where basically I'm saying, Steve, why, you know, or, or I say, Steve, why don't you pick a date? At, at the very end, I say, Steve, you pick a date that you want to go out with me and you, you tell me when you're available. And at that point, you might say something like, oh, you know, it's just a, it's, what would you say, Steve? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, uh, 
<laughs> I, I'm actually seeing someone right now, so it's it's oh, going to be hard gosh. for for me to go on a date with you. It's you know not appropriate. All right, I I totally get that. So so now you're shutting me down, right? So imagine like I'm going through this process with my customer who's saying it's too expensive. Like oh we love your product, it's too expensive. And really, what you want to tell me is like I will never buy anything from you because a I don't like you. B you know uh, I, the other thing I bought from you didn't work. You know, see, I'm kind of going out of business and, and I don't want to tell you that because it's kind of embarrassing. So there's all of these reasons why I'm offering you these objections, which are not necessarily the root kind of objection, but nonetheless, they're proposing barriers. And that's why I say like, not all objections are meant to be overcome. Like people sometimes think that an objection handling exercise is what I refer to as like a column A, column B exercise. Customer says too expensive, we say, oh no, it's not because of A, B, and C, right? Customer says it'll never work here, call me back in six months, and we say this. And the reality is, after we go a few rounds with the customer, we're gonna know whether or not this is something that we can overcome or even wanna overcome. It's like, here's the, the analogy. I remember I used to teach um, self-defense to kids like way, way long time ago. And kids would often ask like, you know, what happens if a grown up tries to grab me? Right, like I'm little and the grown-ups really big, won't they just be stronger than I am? And we, we used to tell them, we said, you ever try to hold a 10 pound house cat that doesn't wanna be held, you know? That's the experience of someone who just doesn't wanna buy something from you and will just keep throwing objection after objection. You will not be able to hold on to that customer. And after a while, when you keep getting these objections, it's a good signal to you to say, hey, you know what? This ain't gonna happen. Maybe we should just walk away and, and not handle it at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think it's, I think the the strategy in objecting objection handling sometimes can just be to get to what the reason is because sometimes it's a stupid reason, right? Like, I guess to, to your to the dating example, like the real reason could have been, I don't know, I I thought you weren't, I, I just thought you weren't rich enough for me to date, but. <laughs> But I didn't want to tell you that because it, it, that that would make me seem super, really superficial. But by by poking away until around at me until you 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 get that out of me, then you could be like, oh well, on our first date we could go on my yacht, and I'd be like, oh, you didn't mention yacht. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that's you know, there's no column A, column B for that. So yeah, uh, the idea is is to have a discuss like it's a discussion, just like anything else in sales. It's not a one hit crush scenario. Yeah, I, 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 I've got a training video that I did on YouTube somewhere and where, where I talk about objection handling and how to get to the objection behind the objection. And I like, I like the way you've kind of laid this out, because, you know, that not all of them are meant to be overcome because that's uh, it's it's uh, it's a different it's a different way of saying it. A, a similar concept. But I, I, I like your way better. I'm stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. look, you know what? And sometimes you can actually tell this because as salespeople, sometimes we we have this kind of, you know, emotional bias where we're like, no, 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 Steve's still going to buy my laser 3000. Like he's just, you know, he just needs a little bit more time. Don't worry. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes that's not the case. You can actually, like I was saying, you can look at the data. So if you look, if you're using like a CRM, like a Salesforce or HubSpot, like take a look at the amount of time that you're spending in certain phases of your sales cycle. Now we're getting kind of really nerdy and sciencey, but for example, look at discovery. Take a look at the amount of time you're spending in the discovery phase of your sales cycle for deals you end up winning and deals you end up losing. So I actually have an article on my on my blog, which I'll share at the end. It's called Sell More by Losing Faster. And I noticed this really interesting trend, which was the deals that we ended up losing, we actually ended up spending way longer in the discovery phase of the sales cycle. And that was because customer just wasn't giving us the buying signals. Too many objections, like they couldn't get the right people on the phone, that, you know, they kept canceling meetings and we kind of kept holding out hope. Meanwhile, if I know that a typical discovery phase for a deal that we end up winning is a week, right? But the discovery phase of my sales cycle with, you know, Dr. Steve Benson is a month, that's not a good sign. Like, the, you know, maybe Steve's just not that into me and this deal is kind of going off the rails. And so sometimes you can take a look at your deal cycles just from the data perspective and say yeah this does not look and smell like a deal that's going my way and 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 when you look sometimes it's you know too many objections too many like an objection by the way we think of an objection as like oh it's never going to work or it's too expensive but an objection could be call me back in six months you know or, or canceling the meeting at the last minute those are objections as well 
And so if you kind of look at those trends and patterns, you can get a better sense of if these objections, either spoken or unspoken, can be overcome. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, what strategies can you use to get to, to make sure you know the root cause of the prospect's objection in these in these types of situations? Yeah, oftentimes, like I have this little cycle that I kind of think about is, you know, you get an objection, you acknowledge and soften. So you kind of, you know, you move that in the dialogue to the part of the person's brain. You try to identify what the intent is. Are you just trying to get a discount? Are you trying to like push me off? And then I ask clarification questions, right? And oftentimes it's that clarification question that will give me a sense of what my next move should be. And in fact, the data from, for example, Gong shows that top salespeople disproportionately respond to objections with questions versus just responses or like what they refer to as the objection handling monologue. So what I would say is if you just want to put yourself in kind of like that mindset of like, okay, how do I handle objections in this kind of empathetic way and understand what the root cause is, just ask questions when you get the objection versus diving into the monologue. Yeah, I, I think for, and, and this isn't in all in industries, but in, in a lot of industries, you know, it's a price objection that is actually the the root cause. So that people drag their feet and give a million reasons other than I just don't have the money for this. But really the reason they're not buying isn't because your laser is not pretty enough or isn't because they really love their, their five-year-old laser or really, you know, they don't have the time to look at the laser. They just, they're like, I know these lasers cost five grand. I don't want to spend five grand on a laser right now. I am, you know, behind on my mortgage payment. And, you know, so it's, I think, especially in a, in a down economy, it's important to think about, try, if, if it is a price objection that's holding you back, it's really important to uncover that because then sometimes it's, okay, so yeah, this is expensive, but it pays for itself in three months. So you know, if you're lo if it costs five grand, but you're losing fifteen hundred bucks a month, like because you don't have it, if I could prove that to you, would you want to would you want to take a, a harder look? Like that, then all of a sudden you you can kind of that's price objection is always one you can overcome with value, I think, but it's not always the one that comes out of people's mouth right away, right? Hundred percent, and you're absolutely right. What you said about kind of like the emotional state, you know, like if you. Uh, you know, your stock portfolio is doing well, you know, the business is growing, you feel good about investing. But what actually happened, and I work with a lot of like venture funded, you know, technology companies at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was a lot of uncertainty, even companies that were doing well, were kind of being more cautious. Some, some were laying people off, some were downsizing because they were now worried that this thing, which is unknown, could actually last for a long time. And they didn't know what the funding climate was going to be like. So mm -hmm. now it's kind of like they're almost wondering, okay, will I be able to, I was going to raise some more venture capital six months, a year from now. Will my company be worth the same? You know what? It probably won't. I should kind of scale back, even though the fundamentals of their company were the same. And so sometimes just the emotional state that you get around, like imagine, you know, you, you just got into a car accident. You needed to like shell out a, a bunch of money to get your car fixed. And now all of a sudden I come a knocking for this laser. And you're like, ah, it's not, a, I'm going to say it's not a good time. Meanwhile, you're just not in a good emotional state to be spending money right now. And that's the real reason. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, uh, a macroeconomist would tell you this is how recessions are self-fulfilling and, you know, create bigger effects than they otherwise would have because of the way we react to, to bad news. 100%. Um, well, the next section is sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers. What's the one thing that people forget when they're handling objections in, uh, in sales today? Just intent, really understand, like trying to figure out what the root cause is. Like we just jump into the objection handling monologue too soon. We think that we've heard the objection before. We don't stop to ask questions and really understand what the person's trying to get at here. What's a, uh, uh, what's one objection tactic that stands out in your mind that way too many salespeople get wrong? You know what? So the, 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 easiest and most powerful objection handling tactic um, that that you might be using but not realizing how powerful it is is using the word because when you handle an objection the word because is a trigger word and it's been scientifically proven that when i use the word because in a sentence it creates this aura of certainty in your mind oh you can't have another cookie because it's 
bedtime. Oh, you know, the, the laser isn't actually as expensive as you think because it's gonna help you be more efficient. The word because kind of signals to your brain, oh, no, there's a reason why this person is kind of reframing my perspective. And just using the word because has actually been shown to increase conversion rates, even if your rationale is not stellar. So I love, you know, using the word because much more intentionally when you're handling an objection. Great advice. And what's a harsh truth that you wish more salespeople in these situations accepted? You're using tactics that would never work on you if you were on the buying side. That's the harsh truth. You know, as salespeople, we try to use these tactics that we've been taught over the years. Meanwhile, you know, we get sold to all the time. You know, I, I, was, I was in, it was in Costco the other day. And my wife said, you know what, we need like a steam, you know, vacuum cleaner to mop up the dog hair. I'm like, okay. And there was a woman there, you know, nice lady. She was demoing these steam vacuums in Costco. And I walked by and I'm like, just out of curiosity, like, how much do these cost? And she's like, oh, do you want to see a demo? I'm like, no, I don't want to see a demo. I just want to know <laughs> how much they cost. <laughs> Meanwhile, you, you know, what do we do when a customer says how much it costs? Well, like, before I tell you how much it costs, let me let me show you how it slices and dices, right? So I'm just giving you this as an example, but we use tactics all the time that would never work on us. Yeah, absolutely. And would you say there's any habits that you have seen in your, in your practice, uh, salespeople using that you think they should stop doing? So, you know, the number one thing that I see people do is kind of what I mentioned earlier, which is try to corner customers or the kind of, kind of the closing questions. Hey, Steve, is there any reason why you don't think you could move forward, you know, with this deal today? You know, what happens is when we uh, restrict our customers and we convey to them that they are not able to choose freely, they resist. It's actually a psychological principle known as reactance. And you experience this when you go into like you go into the mall and you walk into like the gap and the person at the gap says, oh, welcome to the gap, sir. Is there something here I can help you find? And what do you say? I say, how did I just end up in the gap? What have I done, <laughs> what have I done wrong? <laughs> or your favorite store. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I think you just say, no, no, I'm just, just, looking, I'm, just looking. I'm just looking, right? Because. What happens is we don't want to say yes and essentially grant consent for that salesperson to do all their sleazy sales things to us. And so this, this kind of feeling of reactance, we get that, of course, in those situations. But when I also say, hey, how about we go out Saturday night, 2 p.m., you know, like, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Hey, how about I come up to your office and show you the laser next Thursday? I'll give you like a 30, 90 minute demo. Like that also makes you feel like your ability to choose freely is being restricted. And when that happens, you become immediately resistant and shut down. And so are there any bad habits that salespeople should stop doing? Yeah, stop trying to corner your customers because it's pissing them off and you're going to get a no much quicker out of them. And how do you phrase that same uh, situation in a way that allows them to keep their, their, their ability to choose? Very easily. All you do is just give them the option to say no, right? Hey, look, so Steve, you know, it sounds like there might be a way for us to help you in your dental practice. Would it make sense for me to kind of, you know, just show you a little bit about this product and, and I can learn a little bit more about your practice and then, you know, you can decide whether or not it even makes sense to continue the conversation. And, and by the way, like if the answer is no, Steve, that's okay too. Like I, I want to preserve your time. So if I give you the option to say no, it's more likely that you're going to say yes after I've already kind of teased some sort of value, right? So it's kind of like, um, you know, hey, Steve, um, do you want to go out? Saturday night, no, I know we hit it off at Jane's party and you know, you seem like a fun guy. And look, you know what? I think we can have fun. We go to Leafs game. But if if you're not into it, like, hey, like that's okay too. You see, after I give you the out, it's more likely that you're gonna either say yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. Versus tell me, oh, I'm busy Saturday night, right? So if I give you permission to say no, it is more likely you're gonna say yes. Again, this is a thing I talk about in my book as well. And it's also something that's been scientifically proven. Makes sense. And uh, what would you say the greatest sales lesson that you've learned over the years from all your scientific research here? People buy based on emotion. I don't think that's like a, a massive, um, uh, you know, uh, brainstorm that like, oh my gosh, like all of a sudden we discovered this. However, I would say one of the biggest things is the massive conversion power of conviction, right? If you're listening to me and you're thinking to yourself, he really loves what he does, right? You're not wrong, right? I love what I do. And hopefully you can tell I speak about it with passion and conviction, but that also means 
that if you don't believe in your laser, if you don't believe in what you do, I can tell immediately, right? It's like when, <laughs> when Mike, I, this is like lessons learned from, from being a father. I have three, uh, three kids, two are, two are teenagers. And when, you know, when my oldest daughter, she comes to me, she comes to me one night and she had a volleyball practice. She plays on the volleyball team at her high school. She had a volleyball practice early the next morning. She needed to lift to school, but she forgot to tell anyone she had this practice. She comes to me and she's like, um, so, so dad, I'm like, the answer is no. I'm immediately defensive when you approach me like that. Right. And so like, I can tell you don't have conviction in what you're about to say. And I saw this back when I was at Salesforce, I used to run small business sales for the Eastern U S at Salesforce, all these super young, enthusiastic sales reps. But sometimes I would have these reps that would have lots of activity, lots of calls, lots of emails, lots of client visits, no pipeline. And so I would start listening to their calls and I would hear them and the fear and trepidation in their voice. And I would say, like, you know, Steve, it just sounds to me like you're bothering this customer. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like you don't believe in what you're selling and they're thinking who the hell is this kid and what are they trying to sell me? So passion, conviction, even if you're wrong, by the way, you see this play out in the political sphere. This is not a politically motivated statement, but you see politicians all the time who are persuasive because they have lots of passion and conviction for what they believe, whether it's wrong, right? Whether you believe the same thing doesn't matter. They gain followers because of that passion and conviction and the same thing applies to selling. Makes sense. Well, I'm going to attempt to summarize the, what you taught us today about objection handling and just a, uh, you know, a little two minute summary here. So first of all, um, common sales objections come from a place of emotion a lot of the times. And you can handle these objections by first acknowledging and empathizing with the prospect and then speaking to how your solution can help with the problem they brought up in their objection. There are two different kinds of calls to action. There are interest-based calls to action like are you even interested in this solution? And then there's more specific calls to action, like why don't we meet next Tuesday at 2 p.m. to discuss, discuss all your options? And the interest-based call to action uh, has been found to be more effective in, in scheduling a meeting and getting the next step. So it's almost like you don't wanna take two steps, you wanna take one step at a time, and, and, and that one step is just get the, get the interest based. You can, uh, a powerful framework um, that David loves is the feel, felt, found framework and adds a ton of credibility and, be, and you can put the credibility on actual experts by using uh, the, a we concept by speaking to other people's experiences. So, you know, lot, you know a lot of, I understand why you feel that way. A lot of doctors have felt that way that I've talked to and what they found was. So feel, felt, found, and hanging that credibility on the actual experts. Um, next, the things that your customers value changes every couple of years. And it's important to rethink about how their values might have changed in uh, in the last couple of years and how they're changing right now as as the economy turns from a a decade of of up times to uh, to probably heading into a recession here. Not all objections are meant to be overcome. So if you keep getting different objections from a prospect after a few objections, it can become clear that the prospect is not in fact interested. They they just don't want to go on a date with you. Um, one great strategy is to ask clarification questions in response to objections, and you can sometimes get at the root cause of an objection. So maybe the person you're asking on a date already, uh, already has a boyfriend and, uh, or a girlfriend and they, they, uh, and that's, that was the actual root objection. Uh, but by, by clarifying you, 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 you figure that out as opposed to just throwing out more, more day options or activity options in our, in our uh, date objection handling example here. Well, this has been fantastic, David. Uh, tell me, where can our listeners read more about your work? I mean, I, I know you do workshops for companies and trainings for companies about objection handling. 
where can people reach out to you? Um, tell us about the book. Give us the give us the lowdown on you. <laughs> I'm unreachable. You know, you know, you don't <laughs> want to talk to me. No, no. Uh, so you can always hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on CerebralSelling.com, all one word, which is my website. I give away tons of free stuff. I have a YouTube channel by the same name. Uh, so that's always great where you can hit me up there. And I have uh, my book, of course, called Sell the Way You Buy, which you can get on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. If you feel like listening to six and a half hours of me reading my own book, you can get that on uh, Audible as well. Well, that that uh, that sounds like a, that sounds like good times. <laughs> 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 the uh, so I, I I know people love Audible. I'm I'm always just like ah, but I can read so much faster than I can listen. <laughs> like six hours to read a book. Ah. <laughs> like, yeah, if you can read my book in six and a half hours, more more power power to you. But. Well, if, if you can read it in six and a half hours, I mean, or if you yeah, if you can read it out loud in six and a half, it should take like you know two to read, right? Yeah, you know, theoretically, but you know, I, you know, that's without any kind of you know information assimilation. People tell me about my book is that they it's very easy to read, but it's chock full of like really good tactics. So they like to kind of read it, put it down, try to put some stuff into practice, kind of come back to it a little bit. So you got to savor it. Yeah, I think a lot of the the sales training stuff it's it's one thing to hear it, like feel felt feel felt found, right? Like such a it's like I've heard that a million times. I could probably sit here for ten minutes and like work that into my my mind by just like playing it out in different scenarios and and using it and it would probably improve my abilities right and i've and i've heard that 10 times but i've never i i know i don't do it right because I, I know it's not like in so it's one thing to hear this stuff it's another thing to practice it and bring it into you know it, get it actually take it out of your just knowing about it in your mind and make it into a tool in your belt Hundred percent. You know, it's funny. I, I kind of think of it in the way I describe it as like the Olympics. You know, if you ever watch the Olympics, you ever watch the Olympics and you see people do a sport and you think to yourself, "I could do that." It's it's just running. It's just, <laughs> you know, like how hard is that, right? And of course, if you try to do any of that stuff, I'm not talking about like the ski jumping and crazy stuff, but like the regular stuff, you think, "Oh, I, I could do that." But if you really tried to do that, you would hurt yourself, and you're not as flexible as you think, and all this kind of stuff. And so like sales is like that as well. Like you could read something, see something and be like, oh yeah, I understand that intellectually, but to actually work it into your sales motion, take some time. So I'm actually a big fan. You know, even when I do my training, I'm not like a one and done. I don't come in for the day, do the thing and then go off and then, you know, golf claps and then people just go back to their desk and do what they were doing before. Like I'm not in the business of doing that. I focus on one tactic at a time over the course of time so that you can assimilate it into your sales motion in a very natural way. As well, you know, like not every tactic is going to be for everyone. You know, you already probably have a selling style. And, you know, it's kind of like if you have a golf swing, I don't want to rework the whole golf swing. I just want to try to work on a couple of things that are very complementary to what you're already doing. So that's the way I would think about any of the sales tactics you read as well. Absolutely. Great advice. Well, this has been a, a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk here. Um, if you work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps, number one route planner. Helps you sell 20% more, drive 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com. And if anyone can think of any other reps that would benefit from the things that David has taught us about today with objection handling, definitely send this along to him. David, thanks a ton for being here. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Take care, guys. Thank you.